It's time, Legion Gents, about to spit about some film reels. Cop in the field to seal the deal of what the films reveal. Batman, Superman, even Spider-Man compared to fair against each other, tearing apart the plots that they prepare. But these are just a few examples for the task at hand. I demand with cinematic contraband to shock the fans. To preach the theme, title, film, eat film. Tis the king regime for cinema guillotines to rock my rhyme kiln. Welcome. Movie Munchers, we got a special, special edition today. The man's voice that you heard before in the rap is joining us. We have Aiden Aids Soberlick. Aids, how's it going? Pretty good. How you doing, Scott? I'm doing damn fine. And then That's damn good. another new voice to the podcast, Kalen, Dragon of the West. Carbeel! Carbeel! Uh, and myself... Scott, Icebox, Nimi, and our boy and yours, Trace Couch Patchin, fact checker. Fact checker usual. Awesome. Today we are loaded with interesting, interesting <laughs> yes, uh, interesting topics and some stuff that we just had to get down to, to brass tacks about. Um, so first, our topic about AIDS. You just gotta say it. most redundant superhero movie that is in it specifically. Just to make money. All right. And then the next topic, which will be? Uh, best musicals of the 2000s. Very nice. And mine, which is uh, best film nominated for best picture in 2014. It's going to be good. It's going to be big. It's going to be awesome. So we all know the rules here. We flipped the coin in the beginning. Kaylin, Dragon of the West, lost. And she's going to have to go first with the topic being... Most redundant superhero film that's in it for money. You have three and a half minutes to start. Go. All right. So my movie was The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Um, and I believe that this movie was the most redundant and only in it to make money movie. <laughs> <laughs> because when, when this movie came out, um, Sony thought they were going to make a lot of money. Um and they were kind of pushing more, like, character development, I would say, because they were going to come out with, um, I think, like, the Sinister Six and a couple other story arcs after this movie, and that's kind of what they were introducing in this film. Um, but the movie didn't end up making as much money as what they thought it was going to, um, and because of that, they decided to scrap the whole thing, um, they ended all series with Spider-Man, any future series that they were going to make, and uh, fired their main actor in, uh, in Spider-Man. And then, on top of it, went to Marvel, sold them the rights to Spider-Man, and just let them have their way with it, I guess. So, you know, that, that's a useless film, I guess, because what they didn't do is focus on the storyline of the actual movie that they were producing. Um, I mean, everyone's always loved Spider-Man, and they expected a good movie, um, and then when they went, they went to a movie that was basically just trying to set up all these other series that they wanted to start. Wanted to start, so they didn't focus on any type of story with their film, and they, they introduced way too many characters, what have you, and it basically flopped. I think it has a fifty three percent rating on Rotten Tomato, roughly. Um, it's in the fifties somewhere, so it it didn't do well. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the movie did make money. Uh, they had a budget of around $200 million to make it, and they grossed $706 million. Um, but obviously, I guess that wasn't enough for them to be able to cancel all future films and sell the rights. So realistically, all they were really trying to do with this movie is make enough money to start making all these other series that they wanted to make. And when that didn't happen, they scrapped the whole venture as a whole. Um, and, you know, the definition of redundancy is something being useless, and that is what this movie turned out to be, was completely useless. And that's all I have to say about that. All right. A little early, but we don't, we don't judge around here <laughs> too harshly. Only Scott and Amy. Yeah. <laughs> um, AIDS, you have three and a half minutes. Begin. Alright, so the film that I chose for most redundant uh, superhero movie uh, for the money was Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice. Obviously, uh, there have been a lot of superhero reboots um, in the past, I don't know how many years, 10 years and whatnot. 
But the reason I chose this movie specifically because I feel uh, Batman and Superman have such long tenured reboots. It's insane. Um, I'll just go down the line on a couple statistics. 1966 uh, was the first Batman. 1992, Batman Returns. Uh, 1995, Batman Forever. And then um, Batman and Robin as well. Then you get into another series of Batman, which started with The Batman Begins with Christian Bale, The Dark Knight, and then The Dark Knight Rises. And then on the other spectrum for Superman, um, there's Superman 1 through 4. The first one started in 1978 and then just continued on from there. And then they had Superman Returns in 2006, about roughly 20 years after Superman 4 was out. And then they completely remade it with Man of Steel and then just went into Batman versus Superman from there. And um, another bad thing I have to say about it is uh, they kept the original actor from Man of Steel, Henry Cavill, but they uh, dished Christian Bale and put in Ben Affleck, which I didn't think really made a lot of sense at all. They just kind of threw him in there, and I don't know. I just felt very redundant and whatnot from there. Um, other than that, if you're comparing it to other... Uh, superhero movies. Um, I also felt that it was very quick to kind of um, put those two together, especially after um, The Dark Knight Rises was finished in 2012. Um, three years later, or four years later, I guess, they're making Batman vs. Superman with a completely different character and whatnot. And um, <clears throat> what's his face? Ben Affleck. And if you're comparing that to other reboots like Spider-Man or like Fantastic Four or even Avengers, um, not all of them has such long tenured reboots and whatnot to go back. So basically my main point of the argument here is just the history um, of both of those colliding to encapsulate basically the biggest reboot in superhero film history if you're comparing it. Um, to other film reboots for superhero movies, but that's all I really got cool. for an argument. All right, we gotta load up these rebuttals now. Oops. Now for the rebuttals, we're chopping the time down to two minutes. All right. So rebuttals, Dragon of the West, you start. Go. Alrighty, so uh, speaking about like reboots and things like that and kind of like the redundancy of them and how unnecessary I guess they are, um, Batman and Superman both, no matter how many reboots they have, have such an incredible folly, following, it's ridiculous. I mean, everybody wants to go see them and that um, kind of takes away from, I guess, Batman and Superman's redundancy because they're still relevant. People want to go see them. Um, and there, it, it's been spaced out decently between the two that people are still super, super excited to see the movies. Whereas with Spider-Man, um, the, the last movie, um, that they did was in 2007 before the Amazing Spider-Man reboot. And they only waited five years to do, to do the next reboot. Um, so the first Amazing Spider-Man was in 2012, and then the second in 2014, so they didn't wait any time to start it again. So uh, the old Supermans were still fresh, or sorry, Spider-Mans were fresh in everyone's mind still, and they really weren't that ready for a new one. Um, so it was kind of a pointless thing to do right away to waste the money that the production company had to put on another movie when people weren't ready for another one. Um... Also, in regards to just going after strictly money, um, Spider-Man more so was the case because they they grossed a, a pretty decent amount. Um, I, like, I, I believe it was $706 million, um, but that still wasn't enough for them to even continue. They, they weren't satisfied with that, and that wasn't enough. Um, with Batman... They had a budget of two hundred and fifty million, so they really went in on it with the production to make it a really great film, and they only grossed three hundred and thirty million. So they really didn't gross that much. Um, so with it being just for money, they didn't they didn't do that. It wasn't just for money. They made a great film. Um, oh, there's more. Okay, and Batman and Superman it still has the hype. Still has the hype that they need. People want to still go see any other movies that they come out with, and they they will. And they're continuing 
with the other characters that they introduced in that film. People are still going to go see those movies, whereas with Spider-Man, they just cut it all and said, fuck it, we're done. Nice. Good stuff. AIDS? How much time do I get? Two. Two? But if your if your last statement begins at two, I let you finish. I went over. Okay. It's okay. Ready? Begin. Okay, so if you're comparing Batman vs. Superman to, let's say, um, Spider-Man rebuttal and whatnot, um, The Amazing Spider-Man, um, first and the second one, um, can you really say they're redundant? Because, I mean, it's almost like introducing um, another part of the comic and kind of extending it and telling um, that story and whatnot. And um, once they stopped the first uh, Spider-Man trilogy with uh, Tobey Maguire in 2007, they waited um, about five years before the first Amazing Spider-Man came out in 2012. And whenever the uh, second Amazing Spider-Man came out, um, I think that was 2014. But anyway, <clears throat> um, so that's five years right there in between um, Spider-Man 3 came out in 2007 and The Amazing Spider-Man. So, um, if you're arguing time to which they kind of, like, are making another rebuttal, um, Batman vs. Superman came out in 20, well, obviously it just came out, and, um, The Dark Knight Rises ended in 2012, and The Man of Steel, um, ended in 2013. Obviously, um, The Man of Steel story kind of continued, um, into Batman vs. Superman, but... For the Batman's perspective, they only waited four years before they continued and basically kind of rebooted that story with a different character and whatnot. Um, I got nothing else. All right. Good round. I feel like the gloves are coming off here. It's yeah, starting, <laughs> uh, starting, to, starting to heat up a little bit, eh? Um, so, Couch, what you got? I got a couple things here. Um, first off, start with Amazing Spider-Man 2, um, 6.8 on IMDb, 53 on, uh, Metacritic, uh, 53% on Rotten Tomato, um, for a fact check against Kalen's opening statement, um, Marvel, uh, Sony didn't sell the rights to, uh, Spider-Man per particularly, they made a deal with Marvel Studios, and now they can co-produce Spider-Man films, as well as use each other's characters in their films. She um, did. Alright, jumping over to Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. Um, you forgot about 1989 Batman. Come on, man. Are you listening to your Batman movies off? One of the best, in my opinion. All right, 27% on Rotten Tomato, 7.0 on IMDb, 44% on Metacritic. Um, this will be the this film was the tenth portrayal of Batman since uh, original film uh, was portrayed. Oh my God, my phone's acting up. In 1943, Superman, on the other hand, has been portrayed 16 times since 1939. That's all I got. Nice stuff. Good. Uh, great round. A lot of uh, fisticuffs thrown here. <laughs> I'll start out with the Spider-Man 2. Uh, I wrote down only main points um, that I thought would stick in my head. Um, so, Sony thought they were going to make money. I thought that was a good point. Uh, the Sinister, Sinister Six being scrapped, that's a good point. Uh, I think the fact that then they sold off Spider-Man. Um, no story, too many characters... Didn't make money. Going over to AIDS and Batman vs. Superman, I think you hit it home with the Batman and Super Superman reboots. I thought you, um, I mean, you eventually got to it in the rebuttal, but you did end up saying that the, re um, the reboots came a little bit shorter and a little bit closer to the other ones. Um, but overall, I felt that redundancy and money-making well, the Spider-Man 2. Uh, Kalen gets the first yeah. point. <laughs> that was good. You should work on your come on, though. Come on! <laughs> she, she, she just said, hi -ya. Oh. Well, <laughs> shit. Well, that's a Kalen thing. All right. No, that was a good round. We've seen uh, many numerous things happen with musicals, uh, specifically Wizard of Oz and Newsies tying. So anything can happen. <laughs> anything can happen. Yeah, that's true. Um, so... We go to AIDS first now for, is it Best Musical of the 2000s? Yeah. Best Musical of the 2000s. Damon did teach me something. <laughs> All right, AIDS, you got three and a half minutes to start out, begin. 
Okay, so the main point I'm going to talk about, uh, well, first of all, my film for Best Musical in the 2000s is Rent, which came out in 2005. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about the social relevance of the film because I feel like it impacts a lot of um, hierarchies of society and whatnot, specifically the American dream. Um, in the film, it's a bunch of bohemians struggling in modern day New York, um, basically to live and pay their rent in quotations and what, whatnot. Um, it covers aspects of love, sexual identity, AIDS identity, high class versus lower class, drug addiction, and um, I mean obviously those are a lot of pinpoints right there. And uh, one of the big things that I feel like it relates to me is it, um, it also struggles or deals with themes <clears throat> um, related to controversy and discussion and whatnot. Um, specifically, when you graduate college, a lot of these uh, characters um, are really just trying to make it, like, graduating college and whatnot, and um, just trying to make it in the real world, and it really shows, like, when you graduate college, you have to have applicable skills to succeed in the real world, and it really shows, um, it really relates to a lot of the viewers and younger people in general. Um, it was one of the first musicals in decades that younger audiences could identify with. Um, it also revolutionized um, the Broadway musical in general for crossing over the likes of like pop and rock into theater music which is pretty much unheard of. So um, I just think it all these aspects speak volumes just so many people can relate to the musical in general. Um, just with the topics of interest in society today, there's a lot to go along with it. That pretty much summed it up all right there. All right. Nice work. Going over to the right here. Here we go. Uh, well, the movie that I chose was Moulin Rouge. Um, it, it, that movie is based in the ni early, early 1900s. I believe actually 1900 exactly. Um, and it, it deals with a young writer... Um, trying to figure out what his ideas of love are. Um, and it, it has a lot to do with kind of... Uh, love is one of the main uh, focuses of the movie. Um, but then just the, the regular struggle of money, love, fame, trying to figure out what's best for you and not listening to what everyone else says. Um, kind of uh, those are the overarching themes of the film. Um, but I'm going to get into a couple... Um, aspects of the film as to why it is the best musical of the 2000s. Um, it got a 7.6 on IMDb, which is a decent score. Um, it was nominated for eight Oscars, including Best Picture and Best Leading Actress. Um, and with that, that was the first musical that was nom nominated for an Oscar in 10 years. So it had a, no musicals have been nominated 10 years before this one was. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of people don't watch musicals. It, it's a very specific demographic of people that do go out and see musicals and actually enjoy, enjoy them. And what this movie did to kind of break through to the general public um, was a lot of what the music choice was. And Craig Armstrong, he was the composer of the movie, um, he kind of, it, he made it into a jukebox musical. And what that is, is a musical that uh, brings popular songs that uh, that basically everyone knows and mixes it into the into the film instead of it just being like a normal musical which is a scene and then a song about the scene and then a scene and then a song about the scene it just kind of follows that pattern um this movie it brought in popular music of the time and it also um did it incredibly seamlessly where the uh, the scene would trans transition into a song period, like a period of music and song, seamlessly. You won't even, you hardly even notice that it's happening, and it's with relevant music that a lot of people liked, like pop music. Um, there was Nirvana that was mixed into it, so it kind of touched on a lot of different demographics of of movie watchers. Um, it also had incredibly popular and accomplished actors who played the main uh, characters in the film, uh, which is Nicole Kidman. And Ewan, I say his name wrong every time, Ewan, Ewan McGregor. Um, so that alone really propels the, mu the movie forward into having um, <clears throat> a lot more success because the acting is really, really well done. 
Um, the year it came out, so 2001, it was named the best movie of the year. It was, I forget the name of the actual source that had named it that. Um, it was a TV company of sorts, and they took a poll out of everyone that watches their shows, and they, they voted Moulin Rouge the best movie of the year and beating out Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring. Garbage. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> 15 seconds. Okay. I didn't mean to throw you off. Sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I mean, the music within the film is just so well done, and the story it is incredibly interesting, along with the way the shots are, are shot, I guess. Um, it, it's just a really high-energy, action-packed movie. Nice. Good way to finish up, even after I interjected. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right, AIDS, I'm not going to lie. You got some catching up to do here, but it's been done in rebuttals. We've For both sure. seen it. We have. Um, we're going to have to see it now. You better use your full two minutes starting now. Okay, I guess the one main knock I have on Moulin Rouge um, compared to my film is that it's obviously a love story. It has like a star-studded cast and whatnot, and the music obviously propelled it from many diff different demographics and whatnot. But um, if you're talking about relatability amongst viewers, it's a love story and it's about um, how people are like coming together, specifically those two, in their love story and how they deal with their struggles through life and whatnot. But I'll compare it to um, the couple in Rent, Angel and Collins. Um, their struggles are much different because they relate to... Um, many different topics of controversy specifically they both have AIDS and um, one thing you can relate to that uh, with the title Rent um, I read this in an article I researched before this is that the title speaks volumes his Angels and Collins know their love won't last forever because they both have AIDS and then they'll have they have a limited time on this earth together so their love is rented and that's just a topic of controversy that continues to be brought up in society today. So that's my big knock on Moulin Rouge is that it doesn't completely relate to the whole U.S. population, but rather it would be a couple different audiences, um, specifically Rent has love, sexual identity, AIDS identity, High class versus lower class, drug addiction, it's got it all. I'm done. He's done. Pretty solid. Two minutes. Moulin <clears throat> Rouge, go. All right, so I feel like one of your main, I, I guess, uh, points was the, the relatability to people. Um, but the only difference, realistically, between your movie and my movie um, is the time period in which it was filmed. Um, mine, yes, was filmed in the early 1900s, but... It is a love story, true and true, um, where this woman, uh, Nicole Kidman's character, uh, she can either support her friends and have the play that she's in be successful, or she can actually be with the man that she loves. And she has consumption, so her time is rented, because she dies pretty shortly. Um, well, she doesn't have much time, so uh, her her choices are a lot bigger than what they would be for a normal person because it's going to be the rest of her life, um, whatever decision she chooses. Um, and, you know, relatability is fine when, you're, when we're trying to compare these two topics, but nobody's watching Rent. People know Rent from being a popular bar Broadway musical. And that's, that's really it, unless you're actually in the play scene and you're in the theater scene, because Rent was not a very big movie. Um, whereas with Moulin Rouge, it was marketed as a movie, not a spinoff of a Broadway play. So what you see in the movie is what you get, and it's not an adaption of an actual play. So a lot, of more, a lot more people flock to this, whereas people flock to your play, but not your movie. And what we're arguing, I guess, is the movie aspect of it. Um, yeah, I think that's it. All right. All right. Let's see here. Couch? All right. Any yeah. big news? I got some facts to check here, guys. All right. We'll start off with Rent. Um, seven 
6.0 on IMDb, 53 on Meta, and 46% on Rotten Tomato. Spike Lee was uh, attached to direct this movie for a very long time, dropped out, but they did leave a line in the movie saying, uh, giving an homage to him that he was potentially, uh, along with other rumored directors, including Baz Luhrmann, who directed Moulin Rouge, and jumping on to Moulin Rouge, 7.6 on IMDb, 66 on Meta, and 76 on Rotten Tomato. Um, the music, uh, musical that was last nominated before this picture, uh, for Best Picture, was 1991's Beauty and the Beast, um, and the show was called Film dot 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 insert year, so this one was 2001. Um, and Kaylin, it wasn't filmed in the early 1900s. It was set in the 1900s. <laughs> You're sleeping on the couch. Yeah. <laughs> Couch? Yeah. Couch. Sleeping oh, on the couch? Oh, oh, oh. All right. It makes sense. It does make sense. Wow. Okay. Um, there was, this was pretty one-sided for me. Okay. We're going with best um, musical of the 2000s. Look, I am not against people with AIDS. I think the themes. <laughs> I think, a little I think the themes in Rent are. I mean, you you make me want to watch the movie. Um, but you gotcha, man. With uh, you know, Nicole Kidman's time is literally rented in that that film as well. And I think Baz Luhrmann did so much of a better job. And I don't just think that personally. I I think Kalen really knocked it home with. Um, not only the ratings, the eight Oscars, first musical nominated in ten years, um, but the music choices that she's talking about. Rent is evicted, and <laughs> <laughs> Moulin Rouge is the winner. So, now we have a situation here. It is 2-0 for Kaylin. She wins no matter what. But AIDS, it's never happened on this show yet that there's been a 3-0. Oh, 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 oh no no I meant I don't think it's about to happen because I'm not oh. ready for this one. Um, this is big. It's my topic. We're going with best film in 2014 that was nominated for best picture. The Wolfie of Wall Street man. versus the Man with AIDS in Dallas Buyers Club. <laughs> this is an AIDS movie. Come on, <laughs> Kalen, Dragon of the West. Are you ready? Yes. Here we go. Three and a half. Go. All right, so the movie that I chose was Dallas Buyers Club. Um, just a couple quick facts. Uh, the movie has an 8.0 rating on IMDb, IMDb and then a 94% on Rotten Toma Tomato, which is incredibly good. Um, the movie won three Oscars um, in total, uh, including actor in a leading role and then actor in a supporting role. Uh, so both main characters won an Oscar for their performance. Um fifth film overall to ever have two lead actors win Oscars on the same film, which is great. Um, <clears throat> so, obviously, the acting was amazing. I mean, they both won Oscars for it. Um, but this movie, it has an important topic as well. It, it, it's a real story. It's based off, a true, based off true events about a man um, who contracted AIDS before AIDS medicine was approved by the FDA. So uh, what he did is he created the Dallas Buyers Club and he offered a way um, for these people, I mean, hundreds and thousands of people that have AIDS to actually get their medicine and have a chance of surviving. I believe he was given a couple months or maybe like a year, I'm not sure of the exact time, to live. And he ended up living in real life until 1992. And that wouldn't have been the case if he wouldn't have done, did what he did. And that's a, a part of history that a lot of people didn't know. Um, and with the actors that were involved in this film, being Matthew McConaughey and... Um, I always fucking forget his name. <laughs> Jared Leto. Jared Leto, yes. Um, and with Jared Leto, uh, that brought in, I would say, a lot, of, a lot of people that wouldn't normally watch this type of movie just because the actors that were playing the main roles were so distinguished. Um so, so the message as a whole got out to a lot of people, and it, it really was an impeccably done movie. The acting was phenomenal, especially from Jared Leto. He deserved the Oscar all the way. He did a knockout job. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that that was the best picture of 2014, and it, it deserved to win best picture, even though it didn't. And yeah, I guess that's all I have to say. All right. Not bad. Wolf of Wall Street ready? Mm-hmm. Three and a half starts now. 
Okay, so my film was The Wolf of Wall Street for Best Picture of 2014. The first uh, aspect I'm going to discuss is uh, I loved how the film um, really captured the essence of not just the American dream, but also the American tragedy. The story tells uh, Jordan Belfort's story through Leonardo DiCaprio, who does an impeccable job. What One thing I really loved is the constant narration throughout the whole movie of DiCaprio and um, just everything he had to say um, through Jordan Belfort's character. It really um, shows how a man's mind can be so easily corrupted given um, the scenarios and situations that he goes through, specifically being starting out as a stockbroker, obviously breaking a lot of laws, trying to make money, laundering money, and whatnot. <clears throat> and um, it really shows how in America that in certain situations, in a lot of situations, that money is the only thing that really matters and morals can really take a back seat at times. He would do anything to gain his riches and that eventually leads to his downfall. And um, I really think that the movie was based in the 90s, but it is something that is still culturally relevant today and may someday lead to the downfall of our own country because I do feel like that money is um, something that really just holds a higher priority over a lot of things in our country and whatnot. Um, and also, uh, there are, are a couple other movies that were nominated that they can stay relevant to the time, but they didn't take place in, like, let's say, like, modern day America, per se. Um, if you're talking about 12 Years a Slave, that took place a while ago. Um, even Gravity, um, <clears throat> that took place in the future, but it's not really necessarily relevant towards today's time and um, that's what I thought that this film did a very good job with and um, also had a star-studded cast DiCaprio, Jonah Hill, Martin Scorsese directing I thought they all did impeccable jobs and um, I'm kinda biased toward DiCaprio he's one of my favorite actors but I really think that he did a great job and really pushed the movie um, forward into making it the best that it could be and Scorsese did a really good job directing and that's why I think that it should have won the Oscar in 2014. Very nice. Rebuttals. Kaylin, you start. Two minutes. I'm ready. I'm ready. Go. Alrighty. So, you know, the American dream, is, that, that's being successful, right? Like, you want to make money. You want to be successful in life. Um, it, it's not lying and cheating your way to the top and then skirting out of the punishments doled out to you in the end. Um, which was a point that you had made about how this movie was about the American dream, what have you, whatever. Um, you, you know, this is a three hour movie about crime and partying, basically. Um, and even with that, which usually people love, it, it was at least, at least an hour longer than it should have been. I mean, it really, really, really drug on and it had a ton of hype. I was really excited to see it. And then I was disappointed after I saw it. Um... My movie had Matthew McConaughey and Jared Leto, as I had stated previously, so it was also a great cast as well. I mean, obviously they won Oscars for it. Um, you know, uh, The Dallas Buyers Club, it, was, it really was a heartbreaking movie to watch, uh, just because you knew that it, it was based on true events. Um, and, and, you know, you couldn't look away from it. You had You had to see it through. You, you made a really real connection with the characters, when watching it, you really cared about them, um, which is something that you didn't have in Wolf of Wall Street with Leo. He never really did anything that made you want to care about him. It, it was just a lot of drugs and sex and lying, you know? So it, it makes it really hard for you to really connect with that movie. I mean, it, it's a comedy. It was funny, yes. But did it deserve best film? No. Because it really didn't have any type of message whatsoever, and you really couldn't care about the characters. AIDS, you got two minutes to rebuttal that. Bring it home, AIDS. Here we go. Okay, for Wolf of Wall Street specifically, um, I mean, when I first watched it, I was glued to the screen the whole time. And it's not necessarily that um, 
you can like relate to the characters or care for the characters. I saw it more or less as it being extremely entertaining. Obviously, it was really funny and whatnot, but I mean, I already kind of said this in my initial proposal. Um, just like the problems there are with this country, and you saw that portrayed um, through Leo, through Jonah Hill, through basically all of Stratton Oakmont just swindling money out of people, and they become this huge company, and they just go with the flow from there. Obviously, their success didn't last forever because what goes around comes around. Karma bit him in the ass, and uh, obviously, like Dallas Buyers Club, had a very strong cast, and AIDS awareness has definitely grown and whatnot, but I just don't feel it had the same level of impact towards the problems that there are with America, and that's the main reason why I chose The Wolf of Wall Street, was because I just feel you can take it or leave it, like, it's not necessarily, like I said before, about connecting to the characters or even relating to the characters and whatnot. I mean, obviously some people can relate to it because they may be just as sleazy salesmen as them and whatnot, but um, I just feel like it really epitomized what's wrong with the U.S. right now and what our country is going through, even with the presidential election and whatnot. Like, obviously the two candidates that are running for the president right now don't have they don't have all the power it's that obvious they're basically like political puppets and that just epitomizes how much money has control in this country well beautiful. done beautiful well done let's go to couch patches all right here i am back uh, to fact some or check some facts boom. Atta boy. boom boom did it all right dallas Potters club um Ron Woodruff, which was the character being portrayed by Matthew McConaughey, was actually given 30 days to live, and he lived on for another six years oh, post okay. his diagnosis. Um, also, just a fun little fact for this one, I thought this was insane. The film's budget was so low already that the makeup department was only given a $250 Damn. for their um, for their budget. Um, the film artists were able to work with that, and it even earned them their Oscar. One of the three Oscars the film got was for makeup and hair which I think is pretty insane. Uh, Wolf on Wall Street, 8.2 on IMDb. It's actually in IMDb's top 250 at 145, um, 75 on Meta, and 77% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, nothing to fact check on that one, but I do have a cool fact. Um, wanting to work with Martin Scorsese so badly, Jonah Hill took a pay cut by uh, being paid the minimum of uh, SAG allows, which was $60,000. Um, and this movie was Martin Scorsese's highest grossing film, uh, $392 million worldwide. So nice. he could have forked a little bit more money over to Joan Hill, I think. Yeah, I agree. A lot of good stuff said. You guys picked, obviously, great films because that whole year was packed with just moving films. So I, I don't think you guys went wrong there. I thought you guys got caught up a little bit too much with uh, the themes in the film. So... Because they were nominated for Oscars, I want you guys to give me the best scene in each film and describe it for me. I want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Can we trade these and I'll give you his? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I have a pretty good idea of, of the film. I th the, the argument I think I should go with. But I want to be certain, so I want to make sure. I'll give you one minute. I will actually stop you at that one minute mark. Um, and I want to see what you guys have. We're going to go with um, one minute, explain the best scene in the movie. Kaylin goes first, and begin. Alrighty, so the scene that I'm thinking about is between Rayon, which is Jared Leto's character, and then Sandra Bullock's character. I forget the name, her name. She's the doctor that's treating him. Um, stop shaking your head at me. Um, and, and, and they're just talking back and forth, um, just having kind of an average conversation, you know? Um, and, and Rayon, she, she's going through a sex change, and then she's diagnosed with AIDS, 
and she does not have long to live, same as Matthew McConaughey's character. And the conversation, just them talking back and forth was so sweet, and you could just tell how, like, good Rayon was that um, it, it made you just love that character and want to see them succeed and <laughs> just watch the movie over again, I guess. I don't know. That's all I got. <laughs> all right. Can I fact check her now? You can fact check her now. Sandra Bullock wasn't in that movie. Fuck! It's, uh, Jennifer Darnold. I get those two mixed up every time. <laughs> is that is that a true statement, Trace? God damn she it. Always <laughs> those two she's really up. bad at names in general. So <laughs> no, I'm that's surprised like, she's done so sure. well, this well already. So. Um, no, that was no, that was a good. That was really good. Um, AIDS, you got a minute. Wolf of Wall Street, go. Okay, the scene I'm thinking of is the opening scene where basically DiCaprio starts off Jordan Belfort's story about telling the audience how he got to this point. He says, like, I consume enough drugs to sedate Manhattan, whatever, Queens, Brooklyn, and another suburb, whatnot, of uh, New York. And anyway, he just keeps going on and on, telling the audience how much money he has. He owns a 70-foot yacht and a um, bunch of houses, like the largest real estate in Long Island, most expensive, how he got there. And he's like, is this absolutely legal, whatever I do? Absolutely not. But hey, I'm fucking rich. Who cares? And I really feel like that right there just epitomized the whole fucking movie. And then it transitioned very, very well into the rest of the movie. And that's what really got me interested right away. I was glued to the screen from the get-go, from that opening scene, and it really just took it from there. Good stuff, good Beautiful. stuff. Um, anything to fact-check there? I need nothing there. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, so I had stated earlier that not only have we not had a 3-0 in this podcast before, um, but also that I was leaning one way before we did this, and it could have either sent it to a tiebreaker or it could have just been, okay, topple over this way. Um, and it's going to actually topple over. Um, we don't have a 3-0. You deserve uh, it. You deserve Wolf it. Wolf of Wall sure. Street gets this round. It's yeah. a 2-1 victory for Kalen. Dragon of the West. Corby. Yeah. Oh, he blocked the 3-0. He That's blocked the 3-0. Nobody stuff. has yet done it, and it was... You were rolling. You ran out of juice at the end. Uh, yeah. Um, but, yeah, that was awesome. Great stuff. Check out our YouTube page at the Real Frame of Mind, our E E L Frame of Mind. We are up to thirty nine subscribers. We're pushing for forty. We need forty. Come check on. out our videos. Uh, check out not another top ten. Check out the Steven Spielberg bracket challenge. Our first bracket challenge ever. It was fun. It's quick. Check it out. Check out the short film that we just dropped uh, from last year, which was in a different video. Uh, and <laughs> also check out. On SoundCloud, Colin Wells, C-O-L-L-I-N, Wells, Eye of the Hurricane podcast. All he does is bitch about stuff in the news, and it's great. you got to check it out. you got to follow him. you got to like us. you got to subscribe. Everything like that. Uh, we're going to start making this tournament, aren't we? I think we're going to do a tournament. I really want to do it, and I think it'll be a lot of fun. And we um, got to get Damon to buy a belt, too. Yeah. So you two are automatically entered in the tournament for partaking in Film Eat Film. We'll set up a bracket throughout this summer and see who is the Film Eat Film champion by the end of the summer. So, stay tuned for that. You guys rock. Yeah. And remember... Titans! Titans! <laughs>